This video is about this flickery device here that I'm just going to tuck it out of the way. It looks flickery in the camera but isn't flickery in real life. Likewise the display in the hoppy doesn't flicker to me. The camera shutter speed is very fast because of the lighting. So uh, here's a letter from Kevin in Germany and it says, As promised, I send you the Gura LED orientation light with the weirdly high power consumption. We installed these in our bathrooms about eight years ago as a night light. Decent LED lights were just becoming available back then. These lights are constructed to be fixed in a standard German wall socket, and according to the manufacturer's website, these draw 8.5 volt amps continuously. There is no built-in light sensor to switch them on or off. That is why we now took them out and replaced them with much more efficient wall sockets with built-in light-activated LEDs, similar to what you have reviewed in your channel before. I'll come back to that bit, because it's not necessarily what it looks like. I assume these are mostly used in public or municipal buildings at hospitals, where they don't care so much about power consumption. Maybe you can reverse engineer it and figure out why it is so inefficient. We will take it to bits and we will investigate. Since I ran out of packing material, I filled up the box with candy. I'm sure you won't mind. Schocca Cola, dark chocolate with cola and coffee extract, invented in Germany in 1935 and used in World War II for German pilots and long bombing runs. Still popular today as energy chocolate. One moment. Uh, that'll be this. We shall open this at the end of the video and take a look inside it. Edel Tropfen in Nuss. I've probably done that wrong. A selection of fruit brandies enclosed in milk and dark chocolate with hazelnuts, quite popular in Germany. Now, I have to say, I've already had a box of these sent by someone, and they're one of my favourite ever German candies. These things are amazing. Do you know how, do you know how much they're my favourite? When they arrived and I realised what they were, most of them have been eaten. Sorry, but I'll, uh, well, actually, I'll describe them right now. I'll show you right now. Imagine this is uh, liqueur chocolate, but it's got uh, the crisp sugar shell inside. It's the, you know, the old liqueur chocolates used to have the sugary shell with the liqueur inside. And then it's coated in chocolate and then really coarsely covered in nuts and then more, cho more chocolate, lots of nuts. The main thing about this is it's not just a liqueur chocolate. It's got so many textures. It's, that's what I like in uh, sweets. Lots and lots of textures. This has them. The other things... Kevin sent were toffee, which is actually fairly standard over here as well. It's a popular confection over here. And these, which are Mozart balls, which are um, Austrian, but you get them everywhere in Germany as well. Standard and pistachio flavoured marzipan, I love marzipan, with a nougat or nugget core and glazed with milk and dark chocolate. So I'm going to take a look at these at the end of the video as well. We'll just take a look inside them. I won't start nomming and eating them because uh, some people don't like the slurping noise. And it also kind of makes it a bit awkward when you're trying to make a video with loud slurping noises. So this comes with a all English instruction set here. Um, and this thing... When you connect it up, it just lights all the time. It's got a little red adjuster in the back, a potentiometer, that you can actually set the brightness between 3% to 100%. It covers a wide range, I'd show you that, except it's not that bright to start off with. And also, because I turned that too far, I was turning it backwards and forwards and measuring the consumption, and then I turned it up and it went, tink, and uh, I've snapped something inside. So uh, that just rotates freely now, without dimming anything. It's notable, it says, don't work in it while the power's on, but... The only way you can adjust it and monitor the brightness is to do it with the power on. I guess that's just a cover your ass type of thing. So uh, it's designed for a typically a 230 volt RMS supply. That's a sort of the new Euro voltage that covers. It's got a really huge tolerance to cover the peak UK mains voltage and uh, the sort of lower 220 volt countries. But our voltages are pretty much just the same, and it covers that wide range. Is there much else to say about this? It does say 8.5 volt amp, but that is not the same as watts. So, if we take a look at this, and we take a look at the power unit, it's actually showing a power consumption of 1.8 watts. 1.8 watts, but the power factor is terrible, it's about 0.2, and the current it's drawing is about 40 milliamps. So if you actually take, say for instance, the supply voltage here at the moment, uh, this may waver up and down. I'm just going to lock this off so it doesn't waver up and down intensity too much. If we calculate this, we've got the 0 0.038 milliamps it's showing times the local supply voltage, 247.6 at the moment. Let's go the full wax, say 2.5 equals. 
it's drawing about 9.4 watts effectively, but that's apparent power. It's not real power. Now, in the past, I've said it doesn't really matter because your electricity meter doesn't measure uh, apparent power. But now they're moving to the smart meters. And with the smart meters, they can remotely switch it to stop measuring uh, real power and they can start charging for apparent power. What that means is that if they do that, and some countries do that already, to me it's a money-making thing for the power companies, it's just because they, they want to make more money. It will pay for the smart meters in the long run. It means that although this is only drawing about 1.8 watts, you'll be getting billed for about 8 or 9 watts power consumption. Uh, and let me, let me just doodle that down, it's the best way to actually describe it. Let's doodle it on the back of Kevin's letter here. So if I bring this back in, making sure not to touch any wires here, I'll take the exposure back off so it dims down a little bit. What actually happens here is the sine wave looks like this. And what the capacitive dropper does is it causes a very slight shift. I'm assuming it is a capacitive dropper in here. It's the simplest way to do it. It causes a very slight shift. And that shift pretty much represents the voltage across the LEDs. Not sure how many are in here. And what that means is that uh, although it's drawing what appears to be it's a lot of current, 40 milliamps, it's the only actually the only voltage that's being dissipated. Well, you, you don't dissipate voltage, but the voltage references. This is the voltage. The difference in the sine wave is the voltage of the combined LEDs and circuitry. So it makes it. If you were just monitoring purely current, it would look quite high. But if you monitor current and voltage, as meters are supposed to do, and measure for real power, then it would actually show you what it was actually doing. But the electricity companies, they'll justify charging more because the cables that come from the substation, sub to your house, uh, have to be rated to take the current of that uh, phase-shifted load. So they will be seeing the 40 milliamps, even though it's not actually representative of the real power. So that's they're going to be their justification. Watch them do this. That's what smart meters are going to do. They are, I guarantee they're going to do that. I'm just going to put my hand up there to uh, shield that. Now let me demonstrate another lamp here I've got that's particularly shit. Uh, this one here is a cheapy Chinese lamp and it also has a capacitive dropper but whereas modern LED lamps they often try to run lots and lots of LEDs they have several LEDs in each LED package, but this one they've used eight ordinary LEDs and they're running them at quite high current. Watch what happens when I, I'm going to take these wires out here, gingerly, uh, and I'm going to get the pink socket. Where is my pink socket for the lamp? There it is. So let's take a look at this lamp. And this lamp, it's not super bright. It puts out a decent amount of light, but it's drawing 92 milliamps. The power factor is 0.1, which is terrible, and it's only putting out, effectively, it's, it's saying it's 2.5 watts of power. But what you're going to get charged once they switch to uh, the apparent power readings and the smart meters, you're going to get charged 0 0.092 times 247 0.5 volts equals, you're going to get charged the equivalent of a 22 watt lamp, 22 or 23 watt, which this isn't actually putting out as much light as an actual 23 watt tungsten lamp would have done. Um, and that's just down to the really bad power factor. Yeah, that'll be interesting. I think uh, if the power companies switch to that, there's going to be a shitstorm. I guarantee it. So uh, let's open this unit up now. And I shall just tuck this away, because this one, uh, that, think of it, that was about, ten, effectively, it was apparently drawing ten times the power that it was actually rated. So, let's get the meter out of the way, let's open this up, and see what I did inside. Spudger. I think this is just clipped together, I don't see any screws, unless there's a screw under there. No, no screws. Maybe I should disconnect the wires first. Oh no, it's alright. Ooh. It's got four LEDs and little diodes. There's the little uh, red knob. Oh, look at that circuitry. That is ridiculously amount complex looking. That must be the dimming circuitry. Okay. So what do we have here? 
Uh, I'm just thinking, is this colour color correct at this? It looks strangely odd, the colour at the bench. Oh no, I can't actually adjust that set at the moment. You're just going to have to go with what colour it is. I'm seeing what looks like a plastic dropper, but... I'm, I'm just going to pause and reverse engineer this. Uh, give me a moment. Oh yeah, this is one complex little circuit. That took a while to reverse engineer. Not helped much by the fact there's a transistor here being used as a current regulator. A full-on current regulator with programmable current. Very neat. Uh, and it was marked, the package was marked W01. I thought, OK, that'll be a code for the transistor. Uh, typed it into Google. W01 came up with a PNP transistor. And then I've traced the circuit out. And it's just, I'm thinking, this looks more like an NPN transistor, the way it's configured. And then I metered it out, and it's NPN. Then I looked at more detail, and there's another number, BSP43, which is an NPN transistor. This is a BSP43 transistor. So let's break this down into how the circuit's arranged. It's a capacitive dropper with two 1 microfarad capacitors in series rated 250 volts. Don't know why they've done that. This could well have been a very early LED light. Not sure. Um, it does say on it, 29980502. Could that be 1998? Not sure. But uh, it's really well engineered. So it's got two capacitors in series, and there's various advantages to that. When a capacitor fails, it sometimes shorts between the film. And if that happens, they're supposed to self-heal. Sort of heal. They, they blow the sort of metalisation clear. But if there's two in series, that actually provides a built-in layer of redundancy. The other one will stop it going dead short circuit. So uh, that could be a safety feature, but it could also be so they could fit two, the two capacitors, smaller ones, uh, to make it a lower profile, which is highly possible. There are uh, through-hole components. It's a mixture of through-hole and surface mount. It's got two resistors across it in series to make up the voltage rating, 330k. The one slight thing here would have been nice to see a little link between there, but there isn't. I don't think there is. One moment, uh, I'm pretty sure there wasn't. I'm just going to bring the meter in and check that. Is there? So that's it. That connection to there. No, there's not a link between them. OK, because that would have balanced the uh, voltage cross capacitor. But having said that, it's not really an issue anyway particularly with the polarity reversing all the time. It's more common with the electrolytics. Uh, then there's a 560 ohm, a generously rated, stood off the uh, circuit board, 560 ohm inrush limiting resistor, uh, and then a little bridge rectifier there to convert that to DC. On the other side, there's a resistor with a value of 100k, a smoothing capacitor, this surface mount capacitor here, 100 megafarad, 35 volt. And then these two diodes here are two zeners to spread the load, 10 volt and 10 volt in series, to give a 20 volt supply rail. Quite complex. Really, really complex. Can't help feeling they could have done this a lot simpler, but it's not how they did it. Then we've got the LEDs themselves. Unusually, across every single LED is a diode. I don't know if that's a zener or not. The only way I'm going to find out is to actually break one of these LEDs and see if it still continues to light, because I don't think it's for reverse polarity protection, because that's not really likely to happen. But it might be that because it was the early days of LEDs and they weren't that reliable, maybe if they went open circuit, uh, the, uh, a zener across it, it could be, would shunt that out and it would keep the LED lit. The rest of the LEDs lit. There's a little decoupling capacitor down here, um, just for basically a little bit of smoothing, just st stability. And then it gets really complex again. There's a current regulator based on a transistor with a resistor, 200 ohm resistor, on its uh, emitter. And what happens there is the higher the current goes, the higher the voltage the emitter rises to. And if you set a voltage on the base, then th when the current reaches the level that that uh, it's the current through the resistor has caused the voltage above it, across it, to rise up to about the voltage that's being supplied to it, plus about 0.6, the transistor will start turning off and it will go into a sort of linear region. It will act like a variable resistor. So simply by setting the voltage on the base, you can actually set how much current flows through this. And this is where it gets even more complex. There's a 20-volt supply from this, uh, the uh, capacitive dropper, which is feeding one end of the LEDs, plus it's feeding one end of this circuit, which is a 5.6K resistor, feeding a zener diode, which gives a roughly 
5.5 volt output. Might be a 5 volt scene, it might be higher, but it gives roughly about 5.5. That would actually be, that would be a 5.5 volt scene, wouldn't it? Um, that then feeds this point here. I could have just linked them. And then it goes through the potentiometer on the front, but on the back here, should I say, which when you adjust it, I think, think it's 10k. It's quite hard to measure because it's in the circuit. But uh, I think it's 10k, but then it feeds the base via, well, with this 2.7k form a potential divider down to the zero volt rail, that, uh, which I've marked the zero volt rail with this block, this block, this block, and this block. They're all common. So when you turn the potentiometer, you're putting a variable voltage on the base of this transistor, which then acts as the current regulator. So that is quite complex and interesting. So let's uh, cut one of those LEDs off now and see what happens. What this means is that the capacitor, let's uh, just plug it into the hoppy as a me convenient means of connection. I'm not immediately seeing my quick block down here. Quick test. Hold on, I can see it. That's better. Bring in the cliff quick test. It's so much more convenient and a little bit safer because it doesn't involve poking into those uh, open springy terminals. These are shrouded springy terminals. Not that it really matters, because the circuit board is going to be live. So let's uh, stuff the wires in. Like this. Uh, plug it in. Cliff quick test lid closed. I mention the name again because people keep asking. The LEDs are lit. Let's break one of the LEDs and see if one of these little diodes here does anything. So let's uh, find my schnips and just gently crack an LED off. That LED is now off and the other ones have stayed lit. Let's measure the voltage across that. That must be a zener. What a clever bit of design. That is very, very intriguing. Um, I'm going to set this to about 20 volts. I'm expecting probably a voltage of about 5 volts maybe. Just being careful where I touch here. 4.2. Okay, so they've just basically chosen the little zener across there that's a slightly higher voltage than the LED, the normal LED voltage, which is, under full load, about 2.6 volts. Okay, that's fine. That is clever. They were just not allowing for any problem. Also, I... Uh, in the instructions it said, because of the nature of LEDs, fairly new, colour tolerance may vary, you might even get different colours in the same thing, different colours between units. They were just covering every angle. So, on to Kevin's replacements. So, Kevin uh, thought these were drawing quite a lot of power because they seem to have this volt amp rating of about 8 watts, 8 volt amp. And they do have a, a rating of 8 volt amp, but in reality they're only drawing about 2 watts behind the scenes. His new lights are probably not going to be that much better because they'll be passing out the current through the LEDs and when the light sensor detects daylight, uh, it will actually turn on, on a transistor that shunts them. So they'll actually probably continue drawing current. Uh, so uh, the replacements aren't necessarily any better, but it doesn't really matter anyway because if your meter is p monitoring actual power, then you're not getting charged much for these anyway. It would only be about a couple of euros a year, probably, I'm guessing. So, um, yes, that's quite interesting now. Let's, uh, let's open that tin of chocolate. I'm very, very intrigued. Am I going to go all hyper? Because uh, uh, it's quite late at night. This is probably a wrong time to be eating what sounds like energy chocolate. Ooh. Okay, there's going to be eating noises. It is, is it two layers or have they cheated by putting... No, they have another layer underneath. Right, I'm going to taste a wee bit. It tastes like dark and very coffee-ish chocolate. The strong flavours there are plain chocolate and coffee are the strong ones that are coming through. Let's uh, munch one of uh, Beethoven's balls or whatever it's called. So uh, we'll pop one of these out, I shall just bite it in half and we'll take a look inside it. Milk chocolate. Mm. Mar it's like multiple layers actually. It looks like a couple of different colours of marzipan there. 
And then it's got more truffle in the middle. That's quite interesting. I should place that on there as well. Toffee fee. Now, this is a sort of Europeanish type thing. Is this available in other countries like America, Australia and places like that? It's basically a little uh, toffee cup with a, a nut inside and then a little chocolate disc on top, like a chocolate button. They're very nice, very chewy. And that just leaves, tell you what, oh that marzipan is delightful. The Scottish candy sweet taste is very close to the American. Oh, look at the uh, the pictures, jumpy, that's what is causing that. Is this camera overheating? That It's not even streaming either. So uh, I'm going to bite this. Mm -mm. It's full of liqueur with a sugary shell in there. And um, that is amazing, the texture. So yeah, that was a worthy video. That was a really neat light, really good complex circuitry. Quite well designed, but possibly just a bit over-engineered. And this picture is now so jumpy now, I'm thinking I'm going to stop. Because it might actually be the fact that the room is so hot, it might be affecting the camera now. So I shall stop now.